Uh, welcome everybody to our program. Uh, today, our research topic focuses on one particular instrument of public diplomacy, uh, which is uh, high-level visits by national leaders to other countries. And as we all know, uh, these visits are designed uh, to influence and improve foreign public perceptions. And they provide a platform for national leaders uh, to reach foreign publics through a variety of uh, events and uh, uh, means, uh, including uh, ceremonial events, uh, improvisational moments, and most of all, the media coverage of these events. But how effective are these events and are these efforts? And today we are very delighted uh, to have Benjamin Goldsmith and his colleague with us to discuss uh, the findings uh, from their project looking at the impact of head of state visits. So uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Goldsmith. Um, uh, ben is a professor of international relations at the Australian National University, and his research areas include uh, international public opinion, um, let, I'm sorry, uh, international conflict, international public opinion, and atrocity forecasting. And uh, Ben, as Stacey just mentioned that uh, uh, you visited us, and so welcome back to CPD, although this time is virtually, and we're very delighted to have you uh, join us today. So I turn the floor over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Jay. Um, uh, thank you also to, to Stacy and, and Jesus for helping set this up and to Stacy for remembering us from 11 years ago when we made, made a presentation in person at, at the, the center. Um, I'm a bit sorry, sorry I can't be there in person, especially because the weather's uh, a lot warmer in, in California than it is in Canberra. Australia right now, but good morning from Australia, and I'll jump right right in to my presentation. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen now. Um, so today I'm presenting a forthcoming article uh, that I've co-authored with Yusaku Harayuchi of Dartmouth College and Kelly Matouche of Florida State. Um, the title is, Does Public Diplomacy Sway Foreign Public Opinion? And the article uh, actually has just appeared this morning, so so no no longer forthcoming. It's it's appeared online in in the American Political Science Review. Okay, so as you all would know. Uh, many governments invest significant resources to communicate with foreign citizens. Uh, this type of government-sponsored communication or public diplomacy is today, we believe, a very prominent component of states' overall foreign policy. It, of course, includes a wide range of activities, as Jay mentioned, such as educational exchange, state broadcasting, and cultural events. Broadly speaking, these efforts are aimed to shape global affairs through improving the perceptions of a country, its leaders, people, and core values, and increasing support for specific policies. Put differently, these diplomatic activities are aimed to increase soft power resources. In recent years, the study of public diplomacy has bloomed into a substantial literature but there's surprisingly little well-identified social scientific evidence about the causal effect of public diplomacy. So we ask, can governments actually sway the opinion of foreign citizens with such diplomatic efforts? We argue that providing a rigorous answer to this fundamental question is essential to understand the impact of strategic transnational communication in modern international relations. So what do we do? Uh, to answer the question, we emphasize the importance of expanding the scope of public diplomacy studies. The theoretical literature on soft power has developed with a US-centric orientation. Empirical studies also tend to use single countries, most often the US or at most a few countries. Uh, this focus on single country studies and American soft power doesn't allow us to answer even basic theoretical questions about the general use of public diplomacy. For example, questions about US-China soft power competition or 
the impact of South-South public diplomacy. These should be based on a general understanding of the efficacy of public diplomacy across countries. So to contribute to the literature on public diplomacy and soft power, we focus on a major and ubiquitous tool of public diplomacy, that is the high level political leaders' visits to other countries. So our study speaks to several important issues in international relations beyond public diplomacy as well. Transnational communication is seen as increasingly relevant to international power in the so-called global information age, establishing that leaders can shape public opinion abroad is a foundational step to understanding how and when states achieve their foreign policy goals in this context. And more broadly, public support is relevant to a wide range of international goals. Uh, existing studies show public opinion contributes to a state's policy on international trade, on foreign aid, military coalitions, and military bases, uh, among others. So cultivating foreign public goodwill can shape a partner state's ability to implement a des desired policy across a wide range of policy realms. Leaders around the world devote significant amounts of their limited time to international travel. Matt Malice and Alistair Smith show in a 2019 study that recent U.S. presidents spent up to a third of their time on international trips. We assume the primary reason leaders travel internationally is to have closed door negotiations with host leaders and to discuss security and economic issues. But during high-level visits, foreign leaders engage in extensive public outreach, directly addressing foreign audiences and attending public events in front of TV cameras. For example, they may play catch, they may have sushi at a famous restaurant in Tokyo, they may have a beer, and they may be invited, invited to attend a sumo tournament. So why do they attend public events in front of TV cameras? Given the intense constraints on their time, the fact that visiting leaders often spend significant time on public outreach while abroad indicates they believe this type of public diplomacy has substantial benefits. So we argue that they engage in these public outreach and image building activities because visiting leaders want to influence foreign public opinion. In other words, these events outside closed door meetings are part of their public diplomacy campaigns. We theorize there are two ways visiting leaders can sway foreign public opinion. First, visiting leaders try to increase awareness of themselves and their country among citizens in the host country. Of many possible tools of public diplomacy, high-level visits are especially well-suited to gain the audience's attention because of the large amount of media coverage they tend to draw. Second, they try to convey positive messages and images, often focused on the relationship with the host country and its leader. By sending these messages, they attempt to increase the likelihood that the audience will view them and by extension, their country favorably. But both pathways are contingent on two things, we argue. The first is how the opportunities for public diplomacy are arranged. Usually, host leaders have their own domestic incentives to produce publicly visible and positive results which may shore up their own domestic political support. As invited guests, visiting leaders typically enjoy some level of endorsement from the host, increasing their legitimacy in the eyes of the foreign public. Therefore, in most cases, the host leader's ability to direct domestic attention assists the visiting leader in their public diplomacy goals. At a minimum, some mutual interest must exist or else the visit just won't occur. And second, is how much and in what ways the media cover foreign leaders' visits. Given the mutually agreed nature of the visit and the incentives of both leaders that, that I've just discussed, 
media coverage of high level visits tend to convey positive messages and images about the visiting leader. In the absence of media coverage, the mass public is unlikely to receive any information about the visit. To put it differently, our theory predicts that when public diplomacy visits occur, it is likely that the incentives of the visiting and host leaders are reasonably well aligned and news media are likely to cover, to provide some coverage uh, of the visit. Therefore, a visit raises awareness of the visiting leader among citizens of the host country and conveys positive messages about that leader to them. So given these theoretical expectations, our specific hypotheses are the following. So high level visits increase favorable perceptions of the visiting leader in the host country. They decrease indifferent perceptions such as neither or no opinion or don't know. And they decrease unfavorable perceptions. By increasing awareness, we think that visits could increase positive attitudes by moving respondents from indifference toward a positive opinion. By conveying positive messages, we also think that the visits could decrease the negative attitudes. So to test these hypotheses, we take advantage of a natural experimental situation to estimate the causal effects of high level visits using opinion polls generated in the real world at the time of the visits. So what do I mean by a natural experiment? The Gallup World Poll is conducted in virtually every country in every year. Uh, the timing of high level visits by leaders is not coordinated with the dates of the poll. So the occurrence of a visit during one of these polls can be considered an as if random event, which is the essence of a natural experiment. In other words, a high level visit is the experimental treatment. We use the individual level data from the Gallup World Poll to do our study. The question we use is, do you approve or disapprove of the job performance of the leadership of a given country, such as Brazil, France, Japan, UK, US, et cetera? We combine this data set with our own original data recording the exact dates of high-level visits by political leaders. Therefore, respondents who are interviewed before the visit are considered the control group, while respondents who are interviewed after the first day of the visit are the treatment group. The key assumption here is that on average, if there is no other systematic difference between respondents in these control and treatment groups, we can estimate the causal effect of the difference by taking the difference of, of means. Okay, so by combining the two data sets, we can identify the causal effect of the visit of visits by 15 leaders from nine countries over a period of 11 years to 38 host countries. We compare the approval or disapproval of the visiting leader among over 32,000 people interviewed either just before or just after the first day of the visit. So there are a total of 86 visits in our sample that happened to occur during the Gallup World Poll survey period. This table uh, breaks down these by country and leader. But before showing the results of the analysis, I want to focus on a couple of examples just to illustrate uh, our research design. So these two examples are from our data. Uh, they're from U.S. President Barack Obama's visit to Ghana in 29, 2009 and Japan in 2016. So Obama arrived in Accra, the, the Ghanaian capital, on the 10th of July 2009. In the five days prior, which is actually in our data, in the Gallup World Poll data, only one day since the poll started on the 9th, uh, 50 Ghanaian adults happened to respond to the Gallup World Poll. Among them, 74% approved of the job performance of Obama, 18% were ambivalent, and 8% disapproved. Over the five days after the first day of the visit, 
from the 11th to the 15th, 77 Ghanaian adults responded to the poll. Among those, over 85% approved of Obama's job performance. Less than 12% were ambivalent and less than three disapproved. The increase in approval is over 11 percentage points over, the, over this short period. And all of these changes you'll notice are, are consistent with our, with our hypotheses. So in the May 2016 uh, uh, visit of, by Obama to Japan, in the five days prior to his arrival on the 25th, 170 Japanese adults responded to the Gallup World Poll, which happened to be underway uh, at the time. Among them, approval of Obama's job performance was 40%, ambivalent responses just under 32%, and disapproval was over 28%. In the five days after his arrival, among 118 respondents, approval was 44%, ambivalent responses just over 38%, and negative responses were under 18%. So these changes are also consistent with our hypotheses, with the exception of the rise in ambivalent responses. So why? Uh, what could explain these changes in attitudes among Ghanaian and Japanese people? There, there are some factors that seem consistent with our theory and the findings I'll show you in, in just a minute. So Obama's visit to Ghana was historic in that it was the first trip to sub-Saharan Africa by the first African-American US president. And the visit seemed designed to make the most of this. There were well choreographed events in addition to a joint press conference, including a speech to parliament and a visit to a former slave trade port. The visit to Japan was also historic in that it included the first visit by a sitting US president to Hiroshima. It also included a joint press conference, but during this appearance, Prime Minister Abe publicly rebuked Obama over the recent murder of a 20-year-old woman in, in Okinawa by a, by a US military contractor. In addition, the meeting occurred against the backdrop of Japan hosting the G7 summit, potentially diluting the media attention given to the US president. So these examples illustrate some of the processes we have in mind, but how do we do our analysis on our large data sets? Uh, the statistical method is a basic one, ordinary least squares regression, but we include visit-specific fixed effects. This allows us to estimate the average treatment effect across all visits. We also have to choose a window of time before and after the first day of each visit, so we chose five days, but the effects are, are robust if we make slight changes in this, uh, what's called a window, uh, 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 the window or what's called a, a bandwidth. Um, the outcome variables are approval, disapproval, and, uh, and percent of respondents choosing neither approval nor disapproval. Our treatment variable is defined in the following way, which I mentioned. Respondents who were interviewed before the first day of the visit fall into the control group, while those interviewed after the first day of each visit fall into the treatment group. So the results. Our, our main analysis shows a substantial increase in approval of the visiting leader. There's a 2.3 percentage point increase in approval on average across all these visits. The vertical bars are the 95% confidence intervals, and if they don't include zero, the coefficients are statistically significant, so we've highlighted them in, in red here. Disapproval decreases by 1.4 points, in different responses decrease by 0 0.9 uh, percentage points, although this is barely insignificant. So the effect is, is substantial, uh, substantially large. For example, the effect on the approval percentage is equivalent to 41% of the average total annual change of the approval percentage. In addition, these effects are not fleeting. Uh, the, to estimate the duration, we used a rolling average based on a five-day bandwidth, gradually moving farther from the visit's start. We compare this with the fixed five-day bandwidth control group immediately prior to the visit. 
So this figure shows these results for the three response categories. Most notably, the increase in approval for the visiting leader is enduring. It lasts up to about 20 days from the start of the visit. The reduction in ambivalent responses also lasts for, for a similar period, about 20 days, while the reduction in disapproval is relatively short-lived. So our, our substantive interpretation of this uh, connects back to our expectations about how visits raise awareness and deliver persuasive positive messages or images. If indifferent neither views are more likely to be weakly held and based on low information, then the greater duration of the effect on these views suggests that any lasting impact of a high level visit operates more through informing the uninformed than through persuading those who previously held a negative view of the visiting country or its leader. In other words, citizens who have little or no impression of the foreign leader or his or her country are more likely to exhibit a lasting impact from a leader's visit than those who held a negative view. Also, if our theory is correct, visits should influence public opinion only if the media cover them. In our primary results, we include visits regardless of whether we can confirm any media coverage of public diplomacy activity because we want to keep all cases in which a visiting leader at least had the opportunity to engage in public diplomacy. But to understand whether our expectations about media coverage are correct, we divide all 86 visits into those with and without media coverage of public diplomacy, such as tours of important sites, meetings with citizens, or televised press conferences. So the right panel here shows in ca that cases with evidence of media coverage of public diplomacy have a large and significant increase in approval and significant decreases in the other responses. In contrast, on the left panel, there is no effect when there is no evidence of media coverage of public diplomacy. These results then suggest, as we expect, causal mechanisms involving visible public outreach and news media coverage help explain the effects that, that we do find. So here are the results of some additional robustness checks. We add some control variables and sequentially exclude some types of visits which may affect public opinion, but not through the public diplomacy campaign itself. The effect persists if we exclude all U US cases, exclude visits with, uh, which, um, in which economic or other aid was announced, or in which major policies or business deals were announced. Overall, our robustness tests show that some small differences in the effects of different types of visits exists. However, the effect on approval remains positive and statistically significant across all of these tests. Therefore, we conclude that our findings are highly robust to the selection or ex exclusion of visit cases based on a wide range of consideration, considerations. There's compelling evidence that the estimated average effects are attributable to public diplomacy activities. So it, in a nutshell here, when we focus on visits without evidence of public diplomacy, as in the previous slide, the effects disappear. But when we, re we remove visits with economic or security announcements, the effects remain. And here's another set of sensitivity tests. We check whether the treatment effects are primarily driven by visits of any particular country's political leaders. We exclude all the visits from each country in turn, producing nine sets of estimates. The figure clearly shows that our results are not sensitive to the exclu exclusion of the US or any other country in, in the analysis. So, what do we think? What have we found? Uh, these findings are based on a natural experimental design, supporting the core but hard to test assumption behind most of the literature on public diplomacy. Public diplomacy is an effective tool. Oh, I'm sorry. Public diplomacy actually sways foreign public opinion. This is also the core assumption behind the argument that public diplomacy is an effective tool to increase a country's soft power resources. The effect we find is substantial, not short-lived, 
and not specific to the United States. We believe that our results provide a potential avenue through which to better understand how public opinion forms on a range of important foreign policy issues. The impact of foreign, pol foreign public opinion on international outcomes is closely tied to the ability to influence that opinion, which we demonstrate in this article. We hope that our findings will energize further investigation into the nature of foreign public opinion formation and its downstream effects on policy outcomes. So thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you again for to the Center on Public Diplomacy for hosting this talk. And, and Yusaku and I look forward very much to your questions and comments. Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Uh, congratulations on the publication you know, of the study uh, in uh, the American Political Science Review. Uh, which is uh, you know one of the top journals out there and uh, uh, probably the first article on public diplomacy that's published by the by the by the journal so congratulations um, right. thank you very so much. yeah we uh, so we're gonna go to uh, questions uh, from the audience and uh, uh, but before we do that um, uh, I have a couple of questions uh, let's just uh, get started is Yusaku joining us here we go. <laughs> Hi, Yusaku. Hi. Uh, so, Yusaku Horiyoshi, um, welcome to CPD, back to CPD again, uh, this time virtually. Uh, Yusaku is a professor of government and uh, professor of Japanese studies at Dartmouth College. Um, so, the two of them uh, will uh, be uh, uh, answering uh, questions that we may have about uh, their project. Uh, so my first question is uh, it's a very basic about uh, the, the data set from uh, the Gallup. Uh, so it's this daily this tracking uh, is, is, is every day the data they have is a representative sample or it, it, these, these data are collected uh, for a particular purpose during duration that you know you look at the sort of the representation of the samples through that specific uh, defined time period. I'm just curious about uh, the sort of the data set. Maybe I'll I'll start and we'll yeah. see. Maybe Yusaku will have some something to add. So so yes, the Gallup World Poll uh, uh, does a a um, representative sample in each country uh, in each year. Um, we've looked into into the methods that they use. One of our concerns was that over time the the uh, structure or makeup of the sample might change over the time of the survey period. And, and I think that may be what, what you're getting at in the question. Yes, so yes. if, you know, if it's the case that, for example, all the urban residents are easier to, easier to sample and they respond first, and then, and then the rural residents are harder to reach and, and they're reached later, then we have a systematic difference in the in the before and after that may be associated with our our treatment with the visit, and so we we did a number of robustness checks and and balance and a, a balance test uh, in the analysis to to make sure and and convince reviewers that that our treatment effects were not uh, the result uh, of this. And maybe Yusaka wants to add a few words about that as well. Yeah, so the, the Gallup, as you know, it's one of the, the biggest uh, polling company and they every year they field in the, their survey in close to 150 countries and uh, they do everything possible to get a represent, representative sample. You know, of course, you know, strictly speaking, that may not be a perfectly representative sample, but when it comes to the comparison between respondents interviewed just before and just after, then we assume that there is no systematic uh, difference between these two groups. And uh, there are actually existing uh, political science studies uh, looking at uh, this sort of uh, the discontinuity, you know, just before and just after a certain event happens. For example, there are at least like five different papers examining the impacts of a terrorist attack and then looking at uh, survey responses just before and just after certain terrorist attack and then how that affects people's sense of fear or in support for the US or that or some other outcome variables. But 
many of these studies uh, typically look at just one particular event because it is usually so difficult to find an important event, but that happened uh, by coincidence uh, during the survey sampling period. But uh, in our case, uh, because we use a huge data covering 11 years, uh, we could actually compile 86 different visits. So for each case, there may be some difference uh, between respondents interviewed before and interviewed after, but when we pull all of this, there is no theoretical rationale to, to think that there's a, there's a certain systematic difference. But we try to be as careful as possible, and as Ben said, we did many balance tests and robustness tests, but results are you know, quite robust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. Um, we uh, have a question from the audience, but uh, kind of related to uh, what I was going to ask as well. I'm just curious, you know, because the data set from all these visits um, uh, encompasses a, a number of years, did you guys see any difference, like more the recent visits, uh, you know, uh, the impact, either it's, you know, higher or lower than, you know, in previous times or vice versa, uh, because uh, the, the question actually from the audience is also, because the issue of the media exposure, uh, the media coverage, uh, the assumption is, well, I don't know if this is the right assumption, because nowadays, I guess we allow social media, uh, maybe people are more exposed to this, maybe not, because I, I'm just thinking, you know, in the good old days here, when we just had the three networks that probably people are more like, were more likely to be exposed to uh, this type of high level, you know, prominent foreign affairs stories, as opposed to now there was so, so much competition for people's attention. But anyways, just uh, just curious about if you notice any difference or uh, when you look at the media coverage, uh, did you also look at the social media uh, aspect of this um, in, 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 in the data? Yeah, um, maybe maybe I'll start. So so these these are really good questions and maybe an idea for our next paper. But un <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have much more of an answer than that because we didn't look at social media and we also didn't examine specifically the change over time uh, from the start of start of the study and until until the last years in terms of the different magnitude of the treatment effect. One interesting thing that's somewhat related that that we did find, uh, although it's it's um, you know it's we do, we don't claim we've this is a causal relationship. We find this pattern in the data that newer leaders are are more effective uh, as as public diplomats. Uh, the the treatment effect for leaders who are newer in their term as, as the leader, national leader of a country is larger, whereas with, with a longer period of time, uh, the treatment effect of, of, of leaders who've been in power for a while is, is not, as, not as large. Yeah, so this is also, uh, this is one of uh, some additional um, treatment effects conditional on some things like the relationship between host country and a visiting country and we report these conditional effects in our paper and uh, one of them is uh, the one just uh, Ben mentioned but we call this like a soft, soft power honeymoon so the new leaders yeah the day they tried their best and then the media also you know covers uh, a lot about the new leaders in a positive way so the public diplomats high level visits tend to be you know, larger among the new, uh, new leaders. But uh, the, the question is not necessarily uh, whether uh, the comparing the visit by the same person in early years or later years. Uh, I think the question is more generally uh, like a visit uh, 10 years ago and a visit more recent because the 10 year is long you know, in terms of uh, international communication, transnational, uh, the tran transborder communication. So as we all know, uh, people get more information from the social media. But uh, yeah, as Ben mentioned, uh, this is not something we have uh, tested yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe that can be our second paper. But uh, I also know that there are so many uh, uh, an audience here today. So maybe they can work on another project based on uh, our paper. 
Thank you. Uh, so we have a question about, um, can we extrapolate uh, from these findings uh, to like high level summits, like the G7, you know, the, like the impact that uh, these gatherings may have on the public's perceptions of these different countries, uh, the participating mm -hmm. countries? What are your thoughts? I know it's yeah, not yeah, with yeah, the goal of your study. Yeah. Um, sure, I, I, I can start again. So we we actually had a began with an assumption that the the summit, the multilateral summits would tend to dilute the public diplomacy effect. So in the in the Japan example that that we used in in the presentation, the, the G7 summit was going on at, at the same time. We have recorded. Uh, I, I I had sort of an ar a small army of RAs here in in Australia um, uh, going through each visit and recording all all sorts of different information. We have recorded when there were multilateral summits going on at the same time, or when the visit was only for a multilateral summit. Um, we, I guess we haven't really moved beyond our assumption that a multi, multilateral summit would dilute the chance for individual public diplomacy, especially if there were no bilateral meeting with the host leader as well. So if, if in our data, if there's a bilateral meeting with the host leader, we include that as an opportunity for public diplomacy. Usually there is a joint press conference uh, which we see is squarely uh, uh, a a um, part of public diplomacy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, in, in in one of the figures that Ben presented, uh, there are so many estimates. So you know we couldn't explain one by one, but uh, one of them compares uh, the treatment effects uh, using all the cases, all of these 86 cases. But uh, another estimate is we excluded the visit. Uh, for uh, for multilateral meetings, and then I see I mean looking at the results, but for example the percentage of uh, approval uh, is 2.27 uh, percentage uh, points increase when we include all of these cases, but if we exclude visit uh, for multilateral meetings, this actually increases to 2.66 percentage point, and then in terms of the disapproval. With all of these uh, cases uh, decreased by 1.39, but uh, excluding these visits, the disapproval decreased by 1.71. So this suggests that uh, our assumption that multilateral meetings dilute the public diplomacy effect uh, is supported by our data. Great, thanks. Um, we have a an interesting, a very good question um, about uh, how is this might be different. I mean, in, how the media systems uh, in different countries uh, may impact the type of coverage received, and therefore the public opinion shifts that you may have observed. So I guess I'll I'll, I'll start again. Um, the our theoretical argument in, in the paper identifies two basic types of media systems. One that, that would be state directed, uh, in you, often in non democratic countries, and another that is more market directed, often you know in in more democratic countries. And we we argue that the effect would be similar, especially given our assumption that that the the visits usually are the product of of mutual interests uh, where the the host leader and the visiting leader have an interest in the visiting visit going well and and in both leaders sort of presenting a, a positive face to to the public and positive messages. Uh, of course, the political contexts are are quite different. Um, but but we argue that different media environments, in this particular situation of a high-level visit, would deliver uh, similar similar results. Uh, you know, I'll stop there. And see if Yusako has anything to add. Yeah. Well, so the the media system is definitely uh, important. The fact that that could condition that could you know, intervene the 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 treatment effects. 
And uh, we have to say that we didn't uh, test this, but, uh, well, actually, well, the, the whole the main point that we want to emphasize in this paper is to present uh, empirically rigorous uh, results showing that public diplomacy matters, that changes public opinion. But there are lots of important questions um, that uh, the, we, the researchers of international relations, specifically researchers of public diplomacy, must examine. These are under what conditions public diplomacy has larger effects or smaller effects. Right? So these are the, the questions we, uh, Ben, I, myself and Katie also want to examine our second, third and fourth uh, and more papers and maybe potentially a book project in the future. But uh, I strongly, we strongly encourage uh, you, know, you and many audience uh, here to uh, examine you know, these conditions under which high uh, public diplomacy produce large effects, small effects, no effects. And uh, I just wanna uh, ask uh, the organizers to, set, to post the link. And uh, the other paper was published online today, but uh, on the same day, we also published a complete replication package. So anyone who is interested in uh, our analysis or wants to do some extension, they please uh, use our data. Uh, the entire data, well, we cannot publish the get up water for, of course, entirely, but uh, we only select the variables that and, and uh, the data that we use, but uh, uh, entire code and, and the country code and everything all in, uh, included in this replication package. So hope some of the, the audience, maybe undergraduate, graduate student can work on some additional analysis based on our data. And I will post more data, even better. Thank you. I think that we have uh, provided link uh, to everybody. Um, uh, so here's a um, question from a career diplomat. Um, so as a career diplomat, a really useful approach for those who actually organize visits since public diplomacy goals and target audiences are not always uh, duly taken into account when actually crafting official or state visits. Do you think that press coverage has served the purpose described by you as amplify, as amplifier in the visits you look at the samples because there was a deliberate mention, uh, intention involved in their crafting or that the benefit, beneficial effect is not directly associated with the organization or the visit itself. Hmm. Yusako, do you want to start this time? I... Yeah, well, I think, uh, the short answer is case by case, but uh, on average, uh, the, the press conference, the media coverage, uh, coverages are in line with the intention of the host country leader and also the, no, no, the visiting leader as well as uh, the host country leader. So when, when they want to promote some good image, then the press conference or certain media coverage uh, you know, actively used. And there is actually an interesting case uh, which uh, we initially planned to use, but we ended up not using uh, in this presentation, is uh, Japanese Prime Minister Abe's visit to Korea. And, and, uh, and, uh, in, in, and it's a long story, but in short, there was a certain uh, tensions between South Korea and, 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 and Japan. So uh, South Korean, uh, uh, the president you know, decided not to hold any uh, press conference or even, you know, the, the lunch uh, right after the summit meetings. So that was a really short visit, but maybe intentionally or unintentionally, uh, Prime Minister Abe used the opportunity of not having lunch to do their, his own public diplomacy. So he and his, uh, you know, uh, uh, embassy uh, staff and, and visitors, you know, uh, who went to, to Seoul with him, went to the local a uh, Korean barbecue restaurant. The media followed, and then you know tried to improve the image of Japan. And that that may be one reason why. You know, that 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 is also another case which suggests uh, the consistency uh, with our hypothesis. So the media me, media I think um, are used quite strategically, and uh, even without the media coverage, the leaders try to do something additional. 
but again uh we this is uh just our interpretation based on our you know cross-national large data but uh, uh in addition to do more data analysis but but perhaps we need many more you know case studies and uh, we also perhaps need to interview uh the public uh diplomacy uh the, the actual the diplomats who actually organize all of these events yeah so thanks for that comment and I, I just just add we we do consider this in our in our theoretical setup as well. We 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 assume that the the leaders have cra are crafting messages to 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 uh, attract media attention and and to filter out to the public. Um, and we even we talked briefly, but we've sort of read a lot and and written a lot that didn't make it into the the final. Uh, version of the paper about visits, for example, that were where there was there was tension between the countries and the leaders, and how the leaders strategized to to convey their particular messages to try to influence domestic opinion in in the host country and shift shift host country uh, attitudes and and positions as well. Thank you. Uh, actually, that we have a question sort of related on uh, the thing that uh, both of you touched on. Uh, so, in in those high level visits where there are faux pas, where uh, what's your take on? I mean, on these situations where, for instance, most recently uh, the Turkish president and the leaders of the European Union uh, when they met. So, uh, in those situations, uh, how does how how does that kind of um, interaction? Uh, sort of impact, uh, I guess, the overall high-level visit visits uh, on the public's perception. I guess you touched on this because it's a it depends on because it, it depending on the sort of the, the context, but also I think things happen during the visit. In this, you know, sometimes it's not planned, but something happened. Not positive things happened, and and in what ways that it's not just merely the visit itself, but it's what actually took place during a visit, whether it's scheduled or unscheduled, improvised things that uh, are not anticipated, how do those uh, transpire, I mean, these things transpire and impact uh, the effectiveness of the high-level visits? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess in one sense, we can only argue that, you know, we our, our expectations are on average, uh, so that, of course, there may be particular events that happen uh, that simply reflect poorly on the visiting country, uh, and there, there's little, you know, there may not be an effect at, for for that visit. But on average, and in the in the, the cases we've examined, um, when unexpected things happen, or when there there are disagreements between the two countries. There, there are seem to be nevertheless opportunities for the visiting leader to to get at least some message across. Uh, an interesting case is U.S. visits to China, and so we've examined these in in some detail. The information we could get from from open sources from the news media uh, uh, on the the extensive negotiations that happened pre-visit about whether a president will be allowed to address the the um, the Chinese public uh, in you know uninterrupted uncensored live or whether it will be censored or whether the the address will be limited or not help happen at all so I think there are times in which you, you, the visiting leader can actually be prevented from from uh, conveying any message whatsoever uh, or almost no message except for maybe images on the TV screen. Uh, so, so certainly, there's a great deal of variation, and and the chance events that happen, um, uh, such as the the murder in Okinawa that I, I mentioned in the the Japan case, you know, are, are things that leaders have to deal with, uh, um, and and they may deal with them uh, in different ways and in ways that don't, of course, uh, accomplish the the goals of the visit for the visiting leader. Yeah. Well. Okay. Um... That's really interesting, uh, the point. And uh, we didn't, well, well, Ben's uh, RA spent so many hours checking every single case, uh, the news articles, and you know, try to understand what exactly happened. But uh, we didn't uh, use 
what exactly happened during each visit to understand the conditional effects or effect heterogeneity. But uh, if among 86 visits we have, and actually uh, the GetUp World Call now has updated data, so by including the data up to uh, 2020, we may have, we, we definitely have more cases uh, for this analysis. So there may be some really interesting cases in which something quite significant, positive or negative, happened after the first day of the visit. So let's say a leader visit like five days, or usually it's just one day or three, two, two to three days. But even like within the three days, maybe something happened in the second day, right? If that happens, that could be really interesting natural experiment within natural experiment, right? So you can compare control group, the pre-visit, but uh, after visit, but after visit, uh, respondents can be even divided into random into two groups, you know, before some, you know, the major event happened during the visit, after the visit. So I'm not sure how many uh, of you attending this, uh, the webinar are interested in uh, some methodological discussion, but this could be really interesting, uh, uh, the case to apply what is called the causal mediation analysis. So the treatment is given, but the treatment effects is conditional on something that happens after after the treatment assignment. And uh, that sort of a causal mediation analysis uh, is used uh, in, for example, survey experiments. But uh, if this is applied to the real world settings using the international data, that I think could be really interesting potential avenue for the next research. So I was just thinking, uh, because some of these uh, head of state visits are very elaborate in the sense that not only the duration, uh, it, it's longer. Uh, you know, I studied one of the uh, visits many years ago. It was it, it was like nine days long. <laughs> it's a nine day kind of a trip. Mm. And, uh, and of course, you know, uh, uh, most of these are maybe like two or three days, like the other type of uh, yeah. uh, duration. Mm. And and especially when you look at these longer visits, um, you almost think like the, the, the people who plan these uh, want the story kind of unfold. Uh, you know, it's it's not because if you do just two days, three days, you know, you really just kind of, you know, first day, I think probably is it. But if it's a nine day visit, you want kind of a, have the sustaining interest, right? If this leader is doing your country, you know, mm -hmm. and it's an important, you know, kind of a presence and you wanted to sustain that. And then you sustain that through a lot of these events and things like that. You wanted to strategically build up all of these things. Mm -hmm. So anyway, to your second, uh, uh, your second point about, you know, uh, how do you, how do we track this kind of impact, you know, sort of over time? And, and looking at more specifically uh, at the events and the type of events um, uh, that were included, uh, you know, uh, during the visit. We actually have a question on this. Let me just uh, read it to you and uh, and see if you have any uh, any more comments. Uh, did you find that a visit that included particular public diplomacy activities, such as press conferences, town halls, visits to you know social organizations or schools? were more effective in conveying positive messages. Also, what about activities uh, that were designed more for domestic rather than foreign consumption? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I don't know how much we, we can answer it. We, we um, sort of grouped the different activities together for the purpose of, of this study uh, to get, a, get an overall treatment effect of of the pub, public diplomacy um, so we we counted any public appearance uh, uh, as a a public diplomacy uh, effort or or activity there were I mean in the in the qualitative evidence that we've gone through and talk a, a bit about in the in the paper there were very interesting uh, activities that seemed seemed targeted at for example subnational groups or particular audiences so narendra modi uh the the indian prime minister uh on one visit to the us uh booked madison square garden 
and had a, a huge rally of, of uh, mainly Indian Indian Americans. And I, I, you know, my sense is that he, he at least at that time had sort of rock star status. And probably there was a real rationale behind that and a real mm. impact on that particular audience. So I think that's a, you know, yet yet another paper uh, for for us or someone to do the, you know, the the most common activity we found was definitely the joint press conference after a bilateral meeting but there were many other sorts such as visits to to important historical sites um, so the the brazilian president went to to uh um sites in south africa that were relevant for the end of apartheid for example um things that are re really really targeted at particular audiences or to have have a particular effect so so i think it's a great question <laughs> we yeah. we only have have the answer that you know this has has a lot of potential for future work i think yeah i agree well um we're almost running out of time uh actually talking about future work so what's next for this project ben maybe you can talk about how that thing I'm sorry, talk about... Maybe we can talk about hard edge of soft power idea, which we briefly oh, report in the paper. Yeah. That's a great idea. Okay. Sure. Yes. So so one question that we that we address briefly in in some uh, uh, supplementary analysis in the in the paper is what we call the the potential of the hard edge of soft power. So we ask whether countries with greater military capabilities or greater economic power, uh, uh, so th the ability to make threats or inducements in, in Joseph Nye's language of, about hard and soft power, also have a soft power advantage. So we, we wonder whether uh, countries like the United States, which is most often studied in the context of, of soft power, uh, will have an advantage over countries that can't uh, um, Im implicitly have major material consequences for the countries that, that are being visited. And, and what we find is really interesting in our initial analysis that, that only for great disparities in power uh, uh, is, there, is there evidence that, uh, say uh, a country like China or the United States or Russia with great military power, it has a somewhat greater effect than than a very uh, a small country without without the those kinds of capabilities. Uh, so in general, we, what we find so far is that there's not much of a hard edge to soft power. Soft power is really soft and can be wielded without the threat even implicit or the, the implication of threat or inducement or material consequences. Yeah, so just briefly, we think this, uh, the first study showed empirical rigorous results, but the second project that we hope to work on and briefly mentioned in the paper is we think cr crit critically important in the literature of public diplomacy and soft power, because in some, as you, you know, we, we are all interested in public diplomacy and soft power, but we also know that uh, the some scholar of international relations or the political science are critical about the study of public diplomacy and soft power. So uh, to, to say that it does matter, not just showing the average effect, but it is not necessarily conditional on the hard power is perhaps uh, a really important topic uh, for this literature. And that's what we want to do next. 